Number 8. Todd Mullis Police in Earlville, Iowa, received an unusual call in 2018 when a farmer named Todd Mullis claimed that his wife, Amy, was unresponsive after what appeared to be a freak accident in their shed. He told the 911 operator that she had no pulse and that she looked gone. Mullis told the police that their son found Amy with a corn rake through her chest and that she must have fallen on the tool. The son removed the rake from his mother's body and they rushed her to the hospital, but it was too late to save Amy who was pronounced dead at the hospital after losing so much blood. The emergency room doctor who tried to save her life noticed that her injuries didn't add up to Todd's story. She had six puncture wounds, yet the corn rake she supposedly fell on only had four tines. Detectives soon learned that Todd and Amy had a troubling marriage. They tied the knot in 2004 and had three children together, but at some point, Amy began to stray. At the time of her death, she was cheating on Todd with someone who worked on their farm. Todd initially denied knowing about the affair, but people who knew the couple told investigators that he had caught Amy with her secret lover. They stopped sharing a bed, and Amy told her friends that if anything happened to her, Todd was responsible. A search of their home computer revealed that shortly before her death, he had researched how the Aztecs punished cheating spouses. Todd was found guilty of first-degree murder and will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Number 7. Jacqueline Alexandra Rivera when someone suspects their partner of cheating, it can cause them to act extremely irrational and do things they wouldn't normally do. One Northern California woman took things to such an extreme that she ended up with a criminal record. Back in 2012, 18-year-old Jacqueline Alexandra Rivera began to suspect that her boyfriend at the time was cheating on her. She went to the 21-year-old's home in San Mateo to discuss his concerns, but he refused to talk about it and the relationship ended. Rivera returned to the man's house around 3 o'clock in the morning, snuck into his bedroom, and lit his bed on fire. She snuck away before his father heard him screaming and put the flames out with a garden hose. He suffered from burns to his arms and legs, but nobody called the police. Weeks later, Rivera's friend told the ex-boyfriend that Rivera had confessed to committing the crime. The person also called the police, and they quickly arrested her. Rivera was found mentally unfit to stand trial, but this didn't get her off the hook for her crimes. She spent the next two years in a psychiatric facility until her mental health was restored. The trial proceeded and she pled no contest in exchange for a maximum five-year prison sentence. Number 6. Tu Tia Huin 29-year-old Tu Tia Huin was shocked to find her 34-year-old husband, Stephen Hafer, dead in the bedroom of their Houston, Texas home in early 2017. She called the police claiming that Stephen had killed himself, but detectives believed that the evidence told a much different story and that perhaps Gwen had a reason for wanting her husband dead. The Houston Police Department said that trajectory of the bullet was uncharacteristic of a suicide and the shotgun that Stephen supposedly shot himself with had been wiped clean. Hyun's story repeatedly kept changing and she eventually admitted that she had been cheating on her husband with an ex-boyfriend. Stephen's parents later told ABC 13 that they had noticed some tension between the couple during their last holiday visit and that the two were having money problems. Shortly before his death, their son said that he was planning to leave Huynh and move out of state with their two-year-old daughter. Police charged Huynh with killing Stephen, but she maintained her innocence throughout the entire case. A medical examiner ultimately determined that Stephen's death was, in fact, a suicide after all, and Huynh was cleared of all charges. She accused the authorities of attacking her right from the beginning, causing her to lose her job as a nurse and robbing her of the ability to properly mourn her husband. It's probably fair to say that her affair and the couple's other problems are what made her such a strong suspect, but just because someone cheats on their partner, it doesn't make them a killer. Number 5. A Burned Bride-to-Be Find out you're being cheated on is one of the worst feelings a person can go through. But it's even worse when the cheater is having an affair with someone you know and trust. One bride-to-be wanted to make sure that she got the last laugh after finding out that her fiancé was cheating on her with her best friend. She ordered a custom necklace from New York-based jewelry designer Liv Portillo and had it engraved with the words, Have My Leftovers. The woman planned to give the jewelry to her friend for her birthday as a way of letting her backstabbing buddy know that she had found out about the affair. She planned to do it in front of other people, and she paid for the necklace with her fiancé's credit card. Portillo, who owns the jewelry company DBL Jewelry, posted the story on TikTok. Many users commented that it was a shame that such a beautiful necklace had such a sad backstory to it. Others wrote that they wished they knew what happened when the customer gave the gift to what, I'm guessing, is now her former best friend. What would you do if you found out your fiancé was cheating on you with your best friend? 
let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 4. Tavner Smith 41-year-old Tavner Smith is well known as the pastor of Venue Church, a megachurch in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that made news headlines in the past for allegedly being a brainwashing cult that's getting rich off people's donations. Smith started the church in 2012 and spent copious amounts of time recruiting members. His efforts paid off. In just a few years, Venue Church became one of the fastest growing churches in the US. The ambitious pastor strongly urged worshipers to donate, claiming that it would bless their personal finances. Naturally, many people saw this as a classically cultish strategy for brainwashing followers and taking their money. The church nevertheless continued to grow, and by the end of last year, it had a presence in two states with as many as 2,000 people attending each service. But its glory days become numbered when people began to suspect that Smith was cheating on his wife. In December, some volunteers paid the married father of three a surprise visit at his home. Smith was in his boxers and had a female church employee over. She was wrapped in a towel. He claimed that he had spilled chili on their clothes and had to wash them, but the visitors didn't buy the story. They had noticed long before then that Smith and the woman, who was also married, seemed to be joined at the hip. The pair spent a lot of time alone in his office and exchanged comments on social media that seemed overly friendly. Rumors began to fly about them having an affair, and a video of the couple kissing in a restaurant began circulating online. Smith never publicly admitted to the affair. He announced last year that he and his wife were divorcing and took a short break from preaching to get his life in order. People began to leave the church and stop donating as the preacher's personal life unraveled. Meanwhile, former members and employees took to social media with stories about how the church had allegedly abused them and taken advantage of their pocketbooks for years. It wasn't long before Smith returned to preaching. His sermons became increasingly pushy and aggressive as he criticized members for not donating enough and told them not to associate with those who had left. The future of Venue Church remains uncertain, but it seems as though Smith's infidelity and shady fundraising techniques may have caught up to him for good. Number 3. Teen Tragedy A new year is supposed to make new beginnings, but this sadly wasn't the case for 15-year-old Diamond Alvarez, who was recently found fighting for her life on a sidewalk outside her Houston, Texas home. Someone had fired 22 bullets into her from behind and left her for dead. It was too late to save the teen. Diamond had left to walk the family dog and never came home. When the dog returned alone, her family knew that something was wrong and went out to look for her. She died in her mother's arms. Investigators soon learned that Diamond had met up with a young man she had recently broken up with after finding out that he was cheating on her. The pair had dated for six months when she discovered his double life. Before Diamond met up with him, on the day of her death, he sent her a text message telling her to keep their relationship a secret. When police went to arrest 17-year-old Frank Delian Jr. at his home, they found a suitcase on his bed filled with clothing and toiletries. Based on the amount of items, Prosecutors said that it was not simply an overnight bag, implying that Delion had plans to flee town and live on the run. They told the judge that they were concerned about him showing up for court, and the high school senior's bond was set at $250,000. He managed to come up with enough money and was released on house arrest. Diamond's mother told local station, KHOU, that she's devastated about Delion's release and that his bond was so low. She also said that she's scared because he lives near her and the family had already received threats from people. The community is demanding justice for Diamond, whose life was senselessly cut short when it was just starting. Number two, reality star Rendezvous. The reality show 90 Day Fiance is known for its controversial couples. During season seven, viewers met Michael Jessen, a 40-something wine entrepreneur from Connecticut who brought his 23-year-old bride-to-be to the US on a fiance visa. Many people accused the young Brazilian model named Juliana Custodio of using her wealthy older husband for money and a green card. But initially skeptical fans began to change their minds about Juliana as they saw her interacting with Michael's kids and getting along with his ex-wife, Sarah. Juliana's willingness to act in the children's best interests and her respect for the mother seemed genuine and mature. Around the time the COVID-19 pandemic began, Sarah was diagnosed with cancer. She and her husband, Sean, fell on hard times, and Michael and Juliana welcomed the couple into their home. For a while, the household seemed like a modern-day Brady Bunch. They put on their best faces for social media, leaving fans both shocked and impressed. After all, it's one thing to get along with your partner's ex, 
but it's another to let them move in and live as one big happy family. But things weren't as picture perfect as they seemed. Several months ago, Michael and Juliana announced that they were splitting. Juliana accused Michael's family of treating her like a maid and living off her money. She abruptly relocated to Germany and revealed right after the move that she's pregnant by her new boyfriend, Ben. Michael was reportedly devastated by the news, which came with rumors that Sarah's husband might be the baby's father. An anonymous tipster told the media that they saw Juliana and Sean making out at the family's home a few months ago, and that Sarah suspected an affair and questioned the baby's paternity. Juliana denied the rumors and insisted that Ben is the baby's dad, but not everyone is convinced. The drama is still unfolding, but many people have already made up their minds and are harassing Juliana on social media. It doesn't help that shortly before the split became public, Juliana made a cryptic post telling her followers that soon everyone was going to hate her. And number one, sickle-wielding scorned husband. It doesn't take much for an argument about an affair to get out of hand. This recently happened in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, where a 31-year-old man lost his temper and hacked his wife to death with a sickle. Identified by police as K. Kumar, the accused murderer had confronted his 25-year-old spouse about her ongoing romance with another man. She often visited her lover, and they kept in touch over the phone. Kumar apparently got sick of it, and a fight broke out in the early hours of the morning. He flew into a fit of uncontrolled rage and attacked her with a weapon. She died immediately from her injuries, according to the police. Sadly, cases like this are not uncommon in India where violence against women is high. In June of last year, a 55-year-old man stabbed his wife to death in the streets of Gujarat because he thought she was cheating on him. A few months before that, a 40-year-old Delhi resident killed his wife in public. She had refused to quit her job and become a homemaker, leading him to think that she was having an affair with a coworker. The woman left her controlling husband and moved in with her parents, but he tracked her down and stabbed her. Number 10, shooting in the bathroom. On April 12, 2021, a police officer in Tennessee walked into a bathroom at Austin East Magnet High School and shot a teenager to death. 17-year-old Anthony J. Thompson Jr. was killed by a cop at school, the one place teenagers expect to be safe. It all started because police received a call from Anthony's ex-girlfriend's mother, claiming Anthony had been physically abusing her daughter. This is a very serious allegation, and so four officers responded to the school to see what Anthony had to say. When they got there, he was loitering in the bathroom. So, the officers went to make the arrest. As they handcuffed the young man, the gun in Anthony's pocket went off and a bullet struck a trash can. But the sound of the gunshot caused such a mass confusion in the small bathroom that Officer Claybo pulled out his gun and shot the teenager, who then collapsed dead on the floor. But listen to how incompetent this police officer is. Not only did he get spooked by a gunshot and immediately shoot the teen who was already in handcuffs, he also shot another officer. After Anthony had been shot and collapsed, Officer Claybo fired again and struck another officer in the leg. Then they wasted time arresting a student who had barricaded himself in the stall because he was terrified instead of tending to Anthony. It took them over a minute to realize the teenager had even been shot. And in case you were wondering, no criminal charges are to be filed against the officer. Number nine, one jealous cop. An officer who had been with the San Antonio Police Department for three years was put on administrative leave in April of 2019. The reason was simple. Nicolette Muniz was arrested on suspicion of assault and family violence and subsequently charged. The incident happened at three o'clock in the morning on a Friday when Nicolette got into a dispute with her boyfriend. She learned that her boyfriend had been sleeping with another woman on the side. Although to be honest, it was a little confusing on whose boyfriend this guy was. He definitely had a romantic relationship with both of them, but wasn't technically with Nicolette at the time of the attack. You see, Nicolette had called Kenneth Marino, but his other girlfriend picked up the phone instead. The two women got into an argument. Nicolette said, I bet you won't say that to my face and the other woman gave out her home address. This resulted in Nicolette showing up outside the woman's home at three o'clock in the morning. She wasn't messing around either. As soon as the woman came out, she beat the snot right out of her. The charges were eventually dropped against Nicolette, but she was given a no contact order with her ex-boyfriend and told by her department to stay away from him. Number eight, the lingerie policewoman. Samantha Sepulveda lived a pretty busy life. She has over 100,000 Instagram fans and also happens to be a police officer in Freeport, Long Island. She's 5'2", full brunette, 
and so hot that she says criminals aren't mad at all when she's the one who arrests them. She even says she almost never has to get into a fight with perps and instead just convinces them to put on the cuffs. Samantha claims her good looks and curves make her job easier because there's less aggression and dangerous situations are more easily diffused. Samantha began her modeling career in 2013 and has traveled all over the world to do photo shoots. It was only three years earlier that she had become a policewoman. In a news interview, Samantha recalled one time when she was phoned to deal with a man who had just beaten up his wife and threatened to kill the police. When Samantha started chasing him, the man was so overwhelmed by her beauty that he stopped, allowed her to arrest him, and then even asked her out on a date. Maybe if we had more cops like Samantha, the world would be a better place. Number seven, taking a bribe. Officer Michael Mosley, or rather ex-officer Michael Mosley, was indicted by a federal grand jury on two counts of bribery. According to United States Attorney Matthew Schneider, the dirty cop took $15,000 in bribes. Michael had been on the force for two decades, but it all started going downhill in April of 2019. This was when Michael was a member of the Major Violators Unit. On April 3rd, he performed a search of a drug trafficker's residence. During the search, he discovered a heap of heroin and cocaine, as well as half a dozen firearms. The drug trafficker confessed that he had even more drugs where that came from, and even signed a confession. But what's weird was that Michael stayed in contact with the drug trafficker afterwards, and the trafficker didn't go to jail. You see, the dealer offered $15,000 in cash to not pursue drug charges. On May 2nd, Michael Mosley collected $10,000 in cash that had been left by the drug dealer in the backyard of some abandoned house in Detroit. Then on May 23rd, the officer took another $5,000. In return, Michael handed the original copy of the signed confession over to the drug trafficker, officially letting him go. Each bribery charge carries a maximum sentence of 10 years in jail. It's doubtful the officer is going to get 20 years in prison after serving on the force for two decades, but he's definitely getting fired and his career is over all over a bit of extra cash. Number six, inappropriate photos and the Utah cop. A cop in Utah kept explicit photographs of a victim who was being extorted, showed them off to his buddies to get a laugh, and then the victim was murdered. Lauren McCluskey was a 21-year-old student at the University of Utah when she went to the campus police in October of 2018. Lauren was afraid of her ex-boyfriend, a 37-year-old sex offender named Melvin Rowland. Melvin had threatened to release extremely inappropriate and embarrassing photographs of Lauren if she refused to do what he said, and she had already paid him over $1,000 not to do it. She went to Officer Miguel Deras with her problem, and he saved the explicit images that were being used to blackmail Lauren on his cell phone. According to the investigation following Lauren's death, the officer showed them to at least one male colleague. He even bragged that he was able to look at Lauren's photos at any time he wanted. Clearly, the officer had no business being in any position of authority. He was a total dirtbag. Plus, nine days after Lauren went to the campus cop for help, getting none, she was shot and killed by her ex. Her parents filed a $56 million lawsuit against the police for the way they handled this case. Lauren's mother says the very people who were supposed to help and protect her daughter instead exploited her and allowed her insane ex-boyfriend to murder her. Number five, stealing a corpse. On November 1st, 2021, something so insane happened that you would think it came straight from a Hollywood movie. A police officer in New Jersey struck and killed a man while driving down Garden State Parkway. Rather than calling it in and dealing with the situation, he picked up the body, put it in his car, and then drove away. Yeah, he stole the corpse of the person he had run over instead of taking them to the hospital or calling for a paramedic. The officer is Luis Santiago, and he was just 25 years old when he became a murderer. He was driving on the shoulder of the road at three o'clock in the morning when he hit Damien Dimka. The cop and his passenger, a male named Albert, left the scene, then drove back a little later and loaded the victim into the car. They didn't alert any other police or even try giving first aid. At the time, Luis Santiago was off duty. The two men drove to Luis's parents' house to discuss with the rest of the family what they should do with the body. But because Luis's father is a Newark police lieutenant, he set things straight. He forced his son to go back to the scene of the crime and he called the police and ratted him out. His own father tattled. Luis had only become an official cop two years earlier in 2019. He has since been suspended without pay and is facing charges of desecrating human remains, vehicular homicide, leaving the scene of a crash, and endangering an injured victim. Plus, his passenger and his mother are being charged with conspiracy. Number four, planting drugs. 
a former Florida deputy was indicted for supposedly planning drugs during a traffic stop. Zachary Wester, who had been a deputy in Jackson County, took a bit of a career tumble in 2018 after these allegations came into the light. He was indicted in 2019 on 52 counts, including misconduct, racketeering, fabricating evidence, and false imprisonment. This is because he didn't get busted just planning drugs on one unwary driver, but roughly a dozen, and those are only the ones that came forward. Most of his cases come from traffic stops in 2017 and 2018, the officer arrested drivers and passengers alike and charged them with possession of methamphetamine and marijuana. But after many of these people came forward to say it was complete nonsense, the police had no choice but to look at it seriously. One of his victims was a mother who had been pulled over because one of her brake lights was broken. Wester then stashed a couple bags of meth in her vehicle and arrested her for felony possession and child endangerment. Zachary Wester arrested so many people on false drug charges that there were just no way the department could keep it quiet. They were forced to start investigating in 2018, even though they almost certainly knew what he was doing all along. He has since pleaded not guilty, although over 120 defendants arrested by Wester have had their charges dropped and been set free. Clearly, the people in charge know exactly what he was doing. Some of the people Wester arrested on fake drug charges went to jail for upwards of a year. One man he falsely arrested for meth possession, Chris Fears, lost his job, he and his wife split up, and his life fell apart because everyone thought he was a meth addict, when in fact it was just a really evil police officer who had nothing better to do than ruin people's lives. Number three, robbing a Marine. Stephen Lara is a Marine from Texas who was robbed by the DEA and had to sue them to get his money back. It happened in February of 2021. Stephen was on his way to visit his daughters in North California when he took out his entire life savings from the bank in cold, hard cash. He had possession of $87,000 stuffed in bags in his car, but he wasn't worried because that was his money. Well, a Nevada State Highway Patrol officer pulled Stephen over because he was driving too slowly. When the officer looked in his vehicle, he saw the bags of cash. The officer was immediately suspicious, but Stephen denied it had anything to do with the illegal activity. It didn't. Nevertheless, a DEA agent was called in to seize the cash. Even though Stephen wasn't charged with a crime, the DEA was still able to seize his money as part of an ongoing investigation. What this means is that even if the police suspect you may have committed a crime, or were intending to commit a crime, they can take your stuff and never give it back. But in this case, the incident went viral. Stephen happened to be a combat veteran who served his country in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he wasn't about to let the DEA steal his entire life savings. He sued them, and they immediately turned over the money to avoid any further embarrassment. Number two, drunk off duty. Ashley Hunter is an officer with the Miami police, but she got into some serious trouble in May of 2021 when she got busted driving drunk. According to her arrest report, Ashley crashed her car on a Tuesday, and she was so drunk when officers showed up that her eyes were bloodshot and watery, and she could barely talk. Ashley refused to take a sobriety test and had to be hauled off to the hospital for minor injuries. After she was released from the hospital, she was taken into custody, then bonded out of jail almost immediately. But here's the part that's really going to bug you. Ashley was busted quite obviously drunk while driving, yet she was given a paid vacation. Ashley was put on leave with pay while an investigation was carried out into her behavior. And last we heard, absolutely nothing has come of the supposed investigation and Ashley hasn't been fired. And number one, stealing human ashes. A man in Illinois is suing the city of Springfield following a terrifying and traumatic incident with six of its police officers. It happened during a traffic stop on April 6, 2020. Dartavius Barnes was pulled over by a cop for speeding and running a stop sign. Okay, that's his fault. But the police officer claimed his vehicle had been involved in a shooting and had a bullet hole in it. So the cops had Barnes exit the vehicle and put him in handcuffs, then sat him in the back seat of his patrol cruiser. Five more officers showed up to the scene, even though there was nobody there except Barnes, and was very secured in the back of a cruiser. They proceeded to pour through his car like a bunch of vultures. And at one point, an officer picked up a sealed urn a small brass object that the officer immediately assumed contained narcotics. The officer unsealed the brass urn, claiming it looked like powdered ecstasy inside. The police told Barnes that they had tested the substance found in the urn and that it came back positive for drugs, either ecstasy or meth. But of course, none of this was true. The urn contained the ashes of his dead two-year-old daughter. The officer was caught on video lying through his teeth. 
He didn't test anything. He just assumed that the substance was drugs, not human ashes. The officers desecrated Barnes' daughter's ashes, and now he's suing the city. They're scheduled to go to court in August of 2022. Number 11. Thomas B. Jedlowski 43-year-old Rosemary Bilquist was working her dogs in a field behind her Sherman, New York home in 2017 when she was shot and killed by a 33-year-old Chautauqua County resident named Thomas B. Jadlowski. He was out hunting during the legal hunting season, but after legal hours, when he mistook Miss Bilquist for a deer and fired a lethal bullet at her. Jadlowski heard the woman screaming. He found her unresponsive and dialed 911. She died from her injuries. Police charged Jadlowski with criminally negligent homicide. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to one to three years in state prison for the crime. Bilquist's husband, Jamie, told Erie News Now that he wanted the defendant held accountable from the very beginning. He also said that he hopes hunters remember the consequences that Jadlowski suffered from hunting after legal hours and that the tragedy compels them to just go home instead. District Attorney Patrick Swanson expressed similar sentiments, stating that he hoped the case would remind hunters of what can happen when basic rules go unfollowed and when guns are used without caution and care. Swanson also said that he hopes Jedlowski will use his experience to raise awareness among hunters about these dangers once he was released from prison. Number 10. A Father-Daughter Tragedy 11-year-old Daisy Grace Lynn George was hunting in Harrison County, Texas, late last year, when her father accidentally shot her with his high-powered rifle. He was cleaning the gun, which he thought was emptied of bullets, when it fired a bullet into the girl's body. The local sheriff's office received multiple calls regarding a hunting accident and rushed to the scene. All the region's emergency medical helicopters were grounded due to inclement weather. Daisy was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance while emergency personnel tried to save her life, but it was unfortunately too late. The family gave the local press their blessing to print Daisy's name in reports of the tragedy. Meanwhile, her father's name remained conspicuously absent from news articles. Authorities announced that an investigation into the incident was ongoing and that their thoughts and prayers went out to the sixth graders' family and friends. The community of Hallsville came together in grief and love following Daisy's death, according to the city's mayor, Jesse Casey. He went on to tell the Longview News Journal that Hallsville is a very unique place. There's a lot of family values and compassion for your fellow man here. A GoFundMe campaign raised over $16,000 to help the family cover funeral expenses. It's probably fair to say that Daisy's father is luckier than some of the other hunters on today's list who were treated less warmly by the communities after they accidentally shot innocent bystanders. Number 9. Mark Henderson It's devastating when a hunter accidentally shoots another person, especially when it's fatal. And it's just as tragic when a sportsman unintentionally fires a bullet into himself and takes his own life. That's what happened to 57-year-old Mark Henderson in 2019 while he was hunting in the woods of Franklin County, Maine. Sheriff's deputies were called to the scene by Henderson himself, who said he had accidentally shot himself in the lower part of his left leg while bird hunting in Flagstaff Township. By the time they got there, he was unconscious. Emergency responders administered CPR to the victim while awaiting hospital transport. Henderson held on for around 40 minutes before he succumbed to his injuries. According to game wardens, his death accounted for one of just three fatal hunting accidents in Maine that had happened throughout the last decade. There are around six non-fatal hunting accidents in the state every year, which, as you'll learn throughout today's video, isn't too bad compared to the number of accidents that some states experience. Number 8. Jimmy Carl Castle Late last year, investigators in Boone County, West Virginia, announced that a 70-year-old man named Jimmy Carl Castle accidentally shot and killed a man who he thought was a bear. Castle was hunting around 11 in the morning on December 1st near the small community of Twilight when he mistakenly shot 30-year-old David Nicholas Green, who was digging for roots in the area. The hunter immediately knew something wasn't right, realizing he may have fired a bullet into a human dressed in black rather than a black bear. Castle sought help from a friend nearby. 
the pair returned to the site, but decided not to search exactly where the so-called bear had been because of the steep terrain. So they concluded that Castle must have shot a garbage bag and called it a day. Green's family reported him missing the next day, and the Boone County Sheriff's Office found the young man's body a little while later. It initially appeared as though he had died from a fall, but a closer examination revealed that Green had been fatally shot. Castle heard about a body being found and decided to do the right thing. He turned himself in and was charged with failure to render aid and negligent shooting involving bodily injury or death. His case is currently working its way through the state's criminal justice system. Do you think the consequences should be less severe because he turned himself in? Let us know in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to subscribe. Number 7. Retired Officer Shot in the Woods Gary R. Hunt spent his career upholding the law as a police officer in the city of Cory, Pennsylvania. Ironically, it wasn't until after he retired that he was struck by a bullet. The 64-year-old was hunting for black bears with his nephew in Warren County last November when the two found themselves crossing a creek on foot. Hunt was walking behind his nephew, who slipped or tripped and fell, causing his gun to discharge. Unfortunately, Hunt was in the bullet's direct path. He died from his injuries. Speaking for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, Information and Education Supervisor Jason Armory told GoEerie.com that the nephew's gun was being tested for malfunctions, but he believed that the ordeal was simply a horrible accident and didn't expect any charges to be filed against the nephew. Armory further added that Hunt was, by all accounts, remembered as a good man. Two of his former colleagues, Corey Police Corporals Jordan Kitchen and Brett Sproveri, described the police veteran of more than 25 years as community-oriented, compassionate, and well-liked. They also said that he really enjoyed being a police officer. Hunt had retired less than two years before the tragic accident. Number 6. Hunter on Hunter Accidents 2021 was a bad year when it comes to shooting accidents in Western Pennsylvania, where three hunters were shot by fellow sportsmen over a two-week span in late November. Two of the incidents were fatal. One 58-year-old man named Lawrence Pavolko suffered a life-threatening injury after being shot in the chest by a hunter in Crawford County. Thankfully, he survived and was expected to recover after undergoing emergency surgery. Pavolko was part of a five-member party that was hunting deer on private property. Three individuals were driving deer, while two shooters remained stationed at fixed locations. The farthest driver spotted a deer and shot. Pavolko followed suit and also fired a bullet at the animal. Then, the middle driver also took a shot, presumably at the same deer, only to hear pain screams moments later. Pavolko was down. His four fellow hunters administered first aid while waiting for emergency medical responders. He was airlifted to the hospital where doctors performed life-saving measures. Sadly, the other two hunting accidents that occurred during that two-week span were both fatal with one claiming the life of a man in his 70s. The other victim was a 64-year-old retired police officer. Number 5. A Fatal Family Error While hunting along a gas line in Cambria County, Pennsylvania last year with family and friends, 71-year-old William Tripp was fatally struck by a bullet. A young relative had accidentally shot him in the head while aiming for a deer, bringing the group's Thanksgiving weekend to a tragic end. Tripp was pronounced dead at the scene. Because the shooter is a minor, the press withheld her name and also opted not to disclose the nature of the child's relationship to the victim. The bullet traveled roughly 300 yards before striking Tripp, according to Cambria County Coroner Jeffrey Lees, who spoke with local station WJAC. He described the tragedy as a heart-wrenching, unfortunate accident. Even more sadly, while this type of occurrence is rare, it's not unheard of. Pennsylvania game warden Shaw Harshaw told the Tribune Democrat that hunting-related accidents happen every year throughout the state. This means that people can count on history to repeat itself, especially after deer hunting season begins later this year. Number 4. Jordan Griffey A Clark County, Missouri teen named Jordan Griffey was deer hunting alone near Cahoka last year when he accidentally discharged his firearm and shot himself in the shoulder. The 14-year-old lost a lot of blood and was discovered dead at the scene. 
The circumstances surrounding Griffey's death are largely a mystery, especially since nobody else was there when it happened. Authorities believe that he tripped and fell, causing his rifle to fire in the process. Any time a young person loses their life, it's undoubtedly tragic. The community was left reeling from the deadly accident, which brought grieving residents together. A GoFundMe campaign raised over $14,000 to cover the funeral expenses for the high schooler, who was remembered fondly for his infectious smile and as a kind and loving person. The Kansas City Star included a video about the four rules of firearm safety in its report of Jordan's death. Hunters are encouraged to keep the gun's muzzle pointed in a safe direction at all times, to treat every firearm as if it's loaded, to be aware of the target and what's in front of and behind it, and to keep one's finger outside of the trigger until they're ready to shoot. Number 3. Hunter Shoots Hiker A lot of hunting-related accidents happen later in the year, which is when many states host their annual bear and deer hunting seasons. But some unintentional shootings happen during other times, proving that a person is never truly completely safe from accidental gunfire. One unfortunate hiker in Missouri learned this the hard way last May, when a turkey hunter mistook the individual for a turkey and shot him, leaving him with life-threatening injuries. Due to the remoteness of the location, rescue crews had to use utility terrain vehicles to reach the victim. Once emergency responders reached the scene and realized how serious the injuries were, they summoned a helicopter to airlift the man to the hospital. But it wasn't the hiker's fault this happened. As the St. Charles County Police pointed out in a Facebook post, the shooting occurred along a commonly used hiking trail in the Weldon Spring Conservation Area off Highway 94. In other words, there are usually people on the trail. Either way, it's probably fair to say that the hunter had a responsibility to ensure that they weren't putting any people in harm's way when they pulled the trigger, although the police didn't touch on this topic in their post. At the time of reporting, the victim's condition remained unknown as he received treatment at a level 1 trauma center. Number 2. Mike Hendrickson Sometimes, a hunter proves to be their own worst enemy by accidentally shooting themselves. That's what happened to Mike Hendrickson, who fired a bullet into his own leg last year while deer hunting in Meagher County, Minnesota. Authorities reported to the scene and found that the man had applied a tourniquet to the wound in an attempt to control the bleeding. The 38-year-old's brother-in-law, Matt Pedersen, set up a GoFundMe campaign in an effort to raise funds for medical expenses. He wrote that Mike was climbing into a tree stand when his gun discharged into his left thigh. Luckily, the man's nephew was with him and immediately ran to get help, while Hendrickson wrapped the tourniquet around his leg. He was airlifted to the hospital, where he received emergency surgery. Pedersen wrote that Mike's first operation revealed significant tissue loss and that the man had broken his femur. He faced a long road to recovery and had already received several surgeries by the time the story hit the press, according to family members. Doctors said Hendrickson might end up losing his leg but that they were cautiously optimistic about being able to save it. Unfortunately, they had no choice but to amputate part of the leg after failing to find a pulse in Mike's foot. Mike's family described him as the type of person who's quick to drop everything to help someone in need, even a stranger. They started the crowdfunding campaign in hopes that he could focus solely on his recovery without having to worry about money. The fundraiser has gathered nearly $12,000 and is ongoing as Mike continues his healing journey. Number 1. Christian Gilly Christian Gilly was just a teenager when he became an international shooting champion. Hailing from Italy, he recently took two team gold medals in skeet shooting. But not even the pros are immune to human error. The 19-year-old accidentally shot himself in the stomach recently while hunting in his hometown near Pisa. He was bending over to pick up spent cartridges when the gun discharged the fatal bullet. His friends, who were hunting with him at the time, called emergency services. Gilly died at the hospital from his injuries. Italian Shooting Federation President Luciano Rossi led tributes to the talented young sportsman, who he said took several first-place world-ranking medals during the international shooting competition in Peru. These are just some of the many awards Gilly has won, in addition to the individual, team, and mixed-team gold medals he took home last May from the European Championship in Osijek, Croatia, according to Rossi. 
Sadly, the team's death shows that even the most well-trained hunters and gun users can make fatal mistakes. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.